Good morning, Stacy. I'm just seeing your comment. <laughs> okay, so I'm not sure who's going to join the live session, but I'm just going to jump right into everything. We're going to be diving into John chapter 5. Um, this is going to be an hour and a half. I'm going to try to get through the whole thing. There are only 54 verses, so hopefully I can get through the whole thing and I have to break this up in parts. But I'm going to quickly pray and scoot my chair up a little and make sure I'm in frame. Nope, I'm not. It's going to be a little awkward because it's been a minute <laughs> since I made any type of videos, honestly. Um, but yeah. Heavenly Father, we thank you for waking us up this morning. We thank you for just allowing us to have working limbs and organs, Father. We thank you for breathing life into us and doing the continuation of your work that you did with Adam. God, I'm asking that you use me as your vessel so that I may help people out there to understand your word in a deeper and stronger way. Amen. So just a quick, simple prayer. Um, like I said, this might be a little awkward simply because I haven't really made a video in a while. I just uploaded um, my August book haul as well as a sort of update on what's been going on as far as like my Wi-Fi situation and then some personal things because I have been struggling these past almost three months now since June basically. So yeah, um, I'm going to dive right in. This is the ESV translation for those of you who are new. It's the single column journaling Bible. This is the Bible that I prefer to use when I am doing these like lessons here on Facebook, YouTube, social media, just because it's an easier translation. And I know a lot of you are either new to the faith or new to really just diving deep into Bible study. I personally prefer the new King James translation because it's closer to the King James. But the ESV English Standard Translation is great. To write, I'm using the Micron 01 Pigma archival ink pen and this is a 0.25 millimeter pen i have regular post-it notes in this like coral color and then i have these that i got from walmart um i think these are pen and gear or just like a regular walmart brand but i'm going to use these since you know we're done basically with summer <laughs> and all of my utensils which are the zebra mount liner highlighters the crayola super tips Crayola Twistables and my Sharpie Smirgard highlighters. So I just have them all here. I do already have the notes posted for John chapter 4 already in the group. Hopefully I don't have to do any edits <laughs> to them prayerfully. Um, if I do, I'll just delete it and then re-upload it and let you guys know. But um, I have me a copy here so that I don't have to keep flipping back and forth to my computer. But um, yeah. So let me just set everything up. Um, what is going on? Alrighty. Just give me one quick second. All right. So, for those of you who are new who will be watching this on YouTube or later on in, in the day, I have a simple process in how I study the word. And that's basically the process that I share with you guys when I do these Bible studies. So, I normally will read a paragraph, a whole chapter, a few chapter, I mean a few paragraphs. It really just depends on the length. So, like for something this small where it's only six verses and the verses aren't that long, I would probably combine it with this paragraph here personally and read it through so i basically read it through once um no marking just reading it through to just have it and you know embedded into my mind the second time i would go in and circle words that i want to define these are either words i do know or words that i don't know i like to do this because then i will go in and define them in the original language because this is a new testament the new testament was basically written in greek so i do look up the greek definition or sometimes the english definition um, once I do that, I then go in verse by verse, underlining and boxing anything that stands out, anything that I really want to 
um, be able to break apart and break down. And then from there, I take my notes and then add color, which you can see here. So I circled words I wanted to define. I underlined everything. I wrote my notes and then correlated it with a color. I do that so that way it's not a mess when I'm looking at it. Like if I look at it, I don't want to just see all black and not know where each note is or get confused with the arrows. At least now with this, I can see, okay, this is green. Here's the arrow that's green to it, and this is the box that's green. So this thought goes with this verse. Sorry if you guys hear the wind blower, I think it is, outside my window. I don't know what's going on, so hopefully it doesn't interrupt the video. But there are people in their backyards just doing whatever they do, I guess. But I'm going to get through this today. So yeah, and I'm actually going to move my mic closer to me. Oh my god, that is irritating to me, so I can only imagine how that feels for you guys to hear. I apologize. Wow. Can you guys hear that? Oh my god. That is insane. Just let me know if you can hear it. I don't want to talk over it. Okay, I don't know. Hopefully you guys can't hear it. I'm just gonna push on through. But um, okay. So this I entitled, let me move all of that out the way, Soul Winner and the Second Miracle. And I did that simply because we learn about the woman at the well, the Samaritan woman at the well, and then we also are able to see the second miracle take place. So I'm going to start off by reading verses one through six. And I know I said before, I normally would combine the two, but for you guys, I'm just gonna do it paragraph by paragraph. So I'm gonna start off with verses one through six. Again, this is the ESV translation. You can use whatever translation you have, whichever one you prefer. Like I said, I personally prefer the New King James. I just use the ESV because it's a lot more easier to use when I am doing these because a lot of people are either new to their faith or are new to really diving into the word. So diving in with verse one, chapter four. Now, when Jesus learned that the Pharisees had heard that Jesus was making and baptizing more disciples than Jesus, I mean, sorry, more disciples than John, although Jesus himself did not baptize, but only his disciples, he left Judea and departed again for Galilee. And he had to pass through Samaria. So he came to a town of Samaria called Shisar. My notes are falling. Shisar. I think that's how you pronounce that word. Um, where did it go? Called Sh Sychar, near the field that Jacob had given to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there, so Jesus, wearied as he was from his journey, was sitting beside the well. It was about the sixth hour. So again, that's just verses one through six. No marking, just reading it through. So now I'm going to circle words that I want you to find. I believe there were only three that I wanted to define. And um, they were Samaria. Sychar and Wearied. And what I'm going to use is a post-it note for definitions. And I forgot another pen. Um, I normally use my Sharpie pen, but I am actually going to be using this Optimus Fine Point pen. I got it from Dollar Tree or like my local discount store. It's similar to the Sharpie pen. I don't feel like looking for my Sharpie pen right now. So I'm just going to use this on the post-it note. So is that right? Yeah, okay. Just making sure I was writing correctly. So Samaria. Nope. That's not writing correctly. Okay. So I need to grab my Sharpie pen 
and it's in my reading pouch. I'm going to do a video on my annotating. I know Angela, um, my sis Ann, hey sis, <laughs> um, she did a video on it and it just, it spurred me into just annotating a lot more of my books, but I've always annotated just the way she does it was different. So I created an annotating pouch, which has all of like my supplies and stuff. And I believe my Sharpie pen is in here. Yes, it is. There it is. Good morning, Tanya. Ah, okay, going back up. Okay, so I got my Sharpie pen. Now I feel a lot better because it'll write better than that other one. But Samaria. Um, and it's basically a city and region in Palestine. The Greek meaning is watch station and it's derived from the word shamar meaning to keep watch or preserve so again you guys can check out the printable i did post it already so you guys can look it through with me as i do this um i think from now on what i'm gonna do is post up the live notes prior to doing the session just because i know a lot of you guys do like to look along and um sometimes i do talk fast or i talk too slow for some people <laughs> So I'd rather you guys be able to have access to it prior to me doing the session so you guys can study with it and then come on with me and study. But, um, okay. So it's a city and region. Sorry if you hear my brother. Everyone's, not everyone, but my brother is here. Our siblings are back in, my other siblings are back in school. My son is back in school, so... But it's all dreary outside. Um, Greek meaning. Okay, I think it's this post-it note that I don't like. I think it's what the, the problem is. The problem is the post-it note, so it's not the pen. Okay. Meaning. Watch. Station. I'm not going to write the whole definition out because you guys can always just look at the notes. But um, the next word is Sychar. I hope I'm saying that right, but Sychar. And that is a city in Samaria. And it's derived, I missed an eye for real. <laughs> Derived from Greek word shekar, meaning intoxicated or strong drink. So this place in Samaria was basically named after um, a very strong drink intoxicating or strong drink and then the last word was wearied and the greek word for that is kopiao Greek is K-O-P-I-A-O -O with the accents. And I mean, we all know what being wearied is, but I just, I, I felt like I needed to look it up in the Greek. I don't know. To grow tired. Be exhausted. Feel fatigued. I hate this post-it note with markers. But that's that. So, colors. Okay. 
So moving on, gotta move that note out the way. So I'm going to now start underlining. So hopefully this is still in frame. Now, when Jesus had learned, this is back in verse one. Now, when Jesus learned that the Pharisees had heard that Jesus was making back, making and baptizing more disciples than John. I'm going to underline the whole verse. And with that, basically the Pharisees were keeping a close watch on Jesus. And though they didn't always attend his doings, they were always able to hear about it. This shows how much they knew his work was good instead of evil, like they tried to tell people. And these baptisms were distinctive calls to Jewish repentance rather than regular purity ab abolition. Abolition? That's required by other Jewish sects for temple, synagogue, and sectarian religious functions. So what Jesus was doing was not the norm for them, and they knew that. They knew what he was doing was actually good, but they lied, obviously, and kept um, saying that what he was doing was wrong. But all in all, basically, they kept a close watch on him as much as they didn't like him. Good morning. Is it Sareka? I don't want to say it wrong. So let me know if that's how you say your name. And I'm glad you're joining us for the first time. So moving on to verse 2. It says, although Jesus himself did not baptize, but only his disciples. So basically, Jesus delegated the work of baptizing to his disciples. This baptism was about repentance and cleansing. This was not done yet with the Holy Spirit because we know that the Holy Spirit did not come to them until about Acts, I believe, if I'm not mistaken. But um, yeah, Jesus understood that he had to delegate the work to others to basically prepare his disciples. So underlining all of verse 2. Jesus delegated work to prepare them. Now, I do have a lot of notes on the uh, printable. But I'm not going to write every last one of them down because some of them are just like thoughts that I just had as I was studying. But moving on to verse three, he left Judea and departed again for Galilee. So Jesus knew that because of his rising prominence and popularity, there would soon be a confrontation with the religious establishment, such as the Pharisees and the scribes. And um, he knew it was not yet his time to confront it. So he turned home and obviously Jesus is God like he could have confronted the situation right then and there. He could have shut it down. But instead, he knew everything was in God's perfect timing. He knew his purpose. So instead of sticking around and waiting for the Pharisees to come, he decided it was his time basically to return home and wait for the appointed time to deal with the Pharisees and all of that that was to come. Moving on to verse four. It says, and he had to pass through Samaria. Now, Jews often took a different route to avoid Samaria, but Jesus took it upon himself to tread where many were afraid or basically ignored. He didn't have to pass through it, but he knew he had a divine appointment and souls to win. So I'm going to underline verse four. Um, Jesus. How do I want to write this? 
Jesus tread treads where many ignore or are afraid to go he knew he had a divine appointment and souls to win I'll add my color once I'm done with these notes. So verse five, it says, so he came to a town of Samaria called Sychar near the field that Jacob had given to his son. Um, basically, I'm going to underline near the field that Jacob had given to his son, Joseph. Um, the land itself was significant for many reasons. So I'm going to name four of those reasons because there's actually several reasons why that land was like important. So the first is that this is where Abraham first came when he arrived into Canaan from Babylonia and built an altar to the Lord. And I'm actually going to read the scripture. If I can just I'm going to open it up on my neck using the Holy Bible app. If it opens. Good morning, Marie. Maria. Sorry, I said Marie, but I meant to say Maria. Good morning. So Genesis 12, 6 through 8. It says, Abram passed through the land to the place at Se Sechem, to the oak of Morah, at the time the Canaanites were in the land. Then the Lord appeared to Abram and said, to your offspring, I will give this land. So he built here an altar to the Lord who had appeared to him. From there, he moved to the hill county on the east of Bethel and pitched his tent with Bethel on the west and I on the east. And there he built an altar to the Lord and called upon the name of the Lord. So that's just the first point of this sort of field that Jacob basically had given to his son, Joseph. And something just popped up on my computer. Awesome. Yay. Everything's done. Sorry about that. <laughs> okay. So then the second important thing, I guess you could say the second important um, significant is that this is where Jacob came safely when he returned with his wives and children from his sojourn with Laban. He also built an altar to the Lord. So basically, this is really where a lot of altars were built. So I'm going to go to Genesis 33. Genesis 33, 18 to 20. And it says, And Jacob came safely to the city of Sechem, which is in the land of Canaan, on his way from Pandan Aram, and he camped before the city. And from the sons of Hama, Hamar, Shechem's father, he bought for a hundred pieces of money the piece of land on which he had pitched his tent. Here, Sorry, there he erected an altar and calls it El Elohi Israel. The third significance to this land is that Jacob had conquered the Amorites with the sword and bow in an unrecorded battle, which is in Genesis 48 and 22. It says, moreover, I have given to you rather than your, to your brothers one mountain slope that I took from the hand of the Amorites with my sword and with my bow. And then the last significance is that this is where the bones of Joseph were eventually buried when they were carried up from Egypt. And you can read this in Joshua 24, 32. As for the bones of Joseph, which the people of Israel bought up from Egypt, they buried them at Sichem. And the piece of land that Jacob bought from his son, from the sons of Hamar, the father of Sichem, for a hundred pieces of money. And it became an inheritance of the descendants of Joseph. So 
that basically has to do with verse five, where it says near the field that Jacob had given to his son, Joseph. So pushing this over, and hopefully I'm in frame because I can't say. And again, um, I'm just reading from the printables that I wrote for chapter four. You can check them out in the file section. They're already there. Hopefully I don't have to do any edits because I don't want to do any edits. <laughs> so we'll see. But um, I am now going to write B5 because this has to do with verse five. And basically I'm going to write this land. was significant I'm gonna say read Genesis 12 6 through 8 semicolon we're gonna do 33 18 to 20 semicolon 48 22 semicolon in Joshua 2432 Now going back to verse 6 it says Jacob's well was there so Jesus wearied as he was from his journey was sitting beside the well it was about the sixth hour Um the only thing I'm going to really underline is the last portion it was about the sixth hour because that's just a time frame um, and this was basically about noon and this was during the heat of day. Jesus being tired would have wanted a refreshing drink and this was considered to be the hottest time of the day. So I am just going to put that note over here. Verse 6. This was noon in the hottest time of the day now let's go with some color I'm going to use this green Crayola super tips and this gray which is a zebra mild liner that I can get color on my paper and not have all this black. Taking a twistable. Okay, so that's just the first paragraph. So moving on to the next paragraph, it's going to be verses 7 through 15. So I'm going to read it through and then make my markings and my notes. A woman from Samaria came to draw water. Jesus said to her, give me a drink. For his disciples had gone away into the city to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to him, how is it that you, a Jew, ask for a drink from me, a woman of Samaria? For Jews had no dealing with Samaritans. Verse 10, Jesus answered her, if you knew the gift of God and who it is that is saying to you, give me a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. The woman said to him, sir, you have nothing to draw water with and the well is deep. 
Where do you get that living water? Verse 12. Are you greater than our father Jacob? He gave us this. He gave us the well and drank from it himself, as did his sons and his livestock. Jesus said to her, everyone who drinks of this water will be thirsty again. But whoever drinks of the water that I will give them, give him will never be thirsty again. The water that I will give him will become in him a spring of water welling up to eternal life. Verse 15, the woman said to him, sir, give me this water so that I will not be thirsty or to have come here to draw or have to come here to draw water. So that is that. Now I'm going to do some defining. If I can look at my paper again. So I think I only had four words. One, two, three, four, five. I had five words. So the first one is in verse 10, and that is gift. The next word is in verse 13, and that is thirsty. The last two are in verse 14, and it's spring and welling. Sorry, there's the last three are in that verse. So verse 14, we have spring, welling, eternal. If that's all. Yes, that's it. So now I'm going to use a pen because these Sharpie markers are just not doing it for me. To do definitions. I'm sorry, I'm just trying to fix this so I can keep my notes in front. Okay, so gift. That is not how you spell gift. Oh gosh. Okay, no, I don't want to do it like that. <laughs> gift. So the Greek is Dor Doreen. Greek word. Doreen. Meaning something. Freely given without payment. Needed or required. And not acquired by merit or entitlement. The next word is thirsty. Greek word is the Dipsio, and it is to desire earnestly. And see, this is why I looked it up in the Greek, because thirsty to me is just like you, you want something to drink, your throat is parched. That's how I think of the definition. But the Greek meaning is to desire earnestly, painfully feel want of or eagerly long for. I never would have thought that. I just would have thought he was talking about a thirst that can only be quenched by some type of liquid substance, honestly. So this is why I like looking up Greek definitions because it definitely breaks down things further for you to understand, especially in the context of the um, the Bible and the scripture. Next word is spring. And you guys know I end up writing chicken scratch in here because, yeah. <laughs> so, again, just look at the notes if you want to know what I'm writing because everything is on the notes. I'm just reading from it. Greek word for spring is pege. Pege? And it is a well fountain. Issue or flow of.
a source of supply for water, blood, or enjoyment. And the last word, eternal. Hopefully I can fit it on here. Greek word is... No, see, I did it wrong. It's not eternal. I need to do welling, so I need to just get a new post-it. Welling is the next word. The Greek word for that is... Halomai. And it means to leap or gush, spring up or bubble. And then the last word here is eternal. The Greek word for that is, it looks like Ionian. But I don't know because I can't pronounce Greek words. I really do want to take a Greek class, though. Like, I want to study theology so bad or go to seminary school. But, yeah, uh, meaning age-long, unending, perpetual. Forever or everlasting. Okay, definitions are done. I need color because my eyes. Okay, definitions are done. I'm just going to uh, try to stick them up here for now. Got my definitions down, so now let's just break down these sentences. My hands are going to be moving around a lot in front, so I apologize ahead of time. So, a woman came, I'm sorry, a woman from Samaria came to draw water. Verse 7. Jesus said to her, I'm underlining that separately, and then I'm going to also underline, give me a drink. So, that first verse is, verse 7 is broken into three parts. A woman from Samaria came to draw water is underlined. Jesus said to her is underlined separately and then I also underlined give me a drink separately. So a woman from Samaria came to draw water. I underlined that because this is letting me know that this woman came for water at an unusual time and alone without companion. She didn't come early in the morning with the other women and she didn't have a man with her. So this tells us that she's a loner. She's also without a husband because I don't I doubt that her husband would have let her go at this time of day alone by herself so that just tells us two things already okay so verse 7 came alone at unusual time The next part where it says Jesus said to her, most rabbis did not speak to women in public, um, even to greet or ask for a favor. It wasn't done at that time error. 
So basically, this is letting me know that Jesus basically disregarded social rules. And you see that he does that a lot. He does not listen to the laws and the rules and whatnot because they have nothing to do with um, God's will. So Jesus disregarded social rules. Then it goes on to say, give me a drink. So I underlined that because it's, it's letting me know that Jesus understood two things. That one, it was better to include others in accomplishing divine purpose. And two, that the way to gain a soul is to often ask a service of it. So the first point me being that um, he knew he had to go to Samaria and save souls. He could have easily bypassed his divine appointment with this lady and just went to meet these people and save their souls but it was through her testimony that he was able to grasp a lot more people so he understood that it's better to include others in accomplishing the divine purpose the second point that i said where um i said that the way to gain a soul is to often ask a service of it it's a lot easier when you speak to someone and basically ask something to open a way for you to begin to minister to them um and i'm trying to find a way that i can ex like an example that i can give but i can't think of one right now <laughs> but um i guess for me in a sense i guess when i meet people in person you know i ask like if i'm reading a book they always ask me a question um, cause I'm, I'm a book nerd. You guys seek my book hauls, but I do read other books outside of like my Christian based books. I do like fantasy and paranormal books and stuff like that. So I'm always with some type of book or e-reader in my hand. I have well over 6,000 ebooks. Um, I'm uh, obsessed with books, but I always find that people tend to ask me a question when I'm reading a book, like what book I'm reading or how do I find time to read or, um, is the book good? like simple questions like that they allow for me to have a sort of walkway or segue i guess into talking about um you know my love for the word or my love for understanding what other people think about the word um because i have been asked a few times like i recently just started getting into biblical fiction which are basically books that are fiction based novels but they're based off of biblical stories and i've read at least five or six so far i've read one on the prophet isaiah and what a what it would have been like if he had a daughter i read one on um queen esther i read a story on ruth and boaz which was phenomenal i also read one on um read a fictional story that's based off of the story of Hosea the prophet and um, his wife and I also read a story about Rahab and those stories allowed me to just open up my mind even further to understanding the scriptures phenomenal so like when people ask me things like what are some good books to read I often now sometimes will mention those books because then those books allow me to segue into Jesus Christ and God and you know being saved and stuff like that but um, that was something very essential that Jesus understood. So what I'm going to write is that Jesus understood two things. One, better to include others in accomplishing ooh, divine my coffee I found this new coffee from Starbucks um, it's like a white chocolate espresso two shot espresso something like that but it's like Garuna coffee beans it is so good and I just I don't put no sugar in it I do add French vanilla cream in it. 
and it is so delicious you guys like so delicious so so good so um purpose And two, let me grab a cracker. The way to gain a soul. Okay. And I'm just correlating them with different colors because we know that I need color in my life. Okay. Moving on. Um, I have nothing for verse 8, but I'm going to skip to verse 9 where it says, A Samaritan woman said to him, How is it that you, a Jew, ask for a drink from me, a woman of Samaria? For Jews had no dealings with Samaritans. So I'm going to underline that whole question. And then I'm going to underline the last part. For Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. So the first part, How is it that you, a Jew, ask for a drink from me, a woman of Samaria? The woman was shocked by jesus's friendliness towards her especially since many people shunned her and we can tell that these people shunned her because in verse 7 it says this woman from samaria came to draw water but in verse 6 we understand that this was about the sixth hour which would be about 12 in the afternoon which was the hottest day i mean the hottest time of the day so she came by herself when she could have came in the morning with other women and she had no man with her to protect her or whatever the case may be and she came at the hottest time during the day so she's completely shocked that someone would even talk to her especially someone that looks to be like a rabbi um and then moving on it goes into says that for jews have no dealings with samaritans jews and samaritans did not get along let alone speak for any reason especially a man speaking to a samaritan woman jews basically separated themselves and stayed away from them and i have cross references for that that i'll get into but i'm going to continue writing first so actually i'm going to do color first because i need color like who who doesn't want color in their lives So the first point is that woman shocked by friendliness. Oh, sorry about that. <laughs> Just a little tired. Um, and there goes that daggone blower again. Um, shocked by friendliness because she was shunned verse 9 again so I'm just going to write that Jews and Samaritans did not get along. So I'm going to read a few scriptures. The first one being 2 Kings 17. And then I'm going to read verses 24 to 28. And it says, And the king of Assyria bought people from Babylon, Kutha, Ava, Hamath, and Seravam, and placed them in the cities of Samaria instead of the people of Israel. And they took possession of Samaria and lived in its cities. And... At the beginning of their dwelling there, they did not fear the Lord. Before the, therefore, the Lord sent lions among them, which killed some of them. So the king of Assyria was told, 
the nations that you have carried away and placed in cities of Samaria do not know the law of God. The law, sorry, do not know the law of the God of the land. Therefore, he has sent lions among them and behold, they are killing them because they do not know the law of the God of the land. And the king of Assyria commanded, send there one of the priests whom you carried away from here and let him go and dwell there and teach them the law of the God of the land. So one of the priests whom they had carried away from Samaria came and lived in Bethel and taught them how they should fear the Lord. The next is going to be Ezra 4 and 30. I'm sorry, 4 and 3. Ezra 4 and 3. Where is it? So again, like I said, it's going to be 2 Kings. 17 24 to 28 Ezra 4 and 3 and then Luke 9 53 So Ezra 4 and 3, but Zerubbabel and Jesh sorry, but Zerubbabel, Jeshua, and the rest of the heads of the fathers' houses in Israel said to them, You have nothing to do with us in building a house our God to our God, but we alone will build to the Lord the city the Lord, the God of Israel, as King Cyrus, the king of Persia, has commanded us. And then Luke nine fifty three. Actually, I'm not going to read that right now. I just want to keep going so we're not here too long. But, um, okay, so moving to verse 10. So verse 10 in its entirety is all about how Jesus drew in the Samaritan woman into the conversation by piquing her, her curiosity. And that's pretty much how you have to do it. Um, you always speak to someone. You, and when you're having a conversation with them, always make sure to pique their curiosity, keep them interested in the conversation and wanting to know more. So the first thing he said was, if you knew God, or if you knew the gift of him, yeah, the gift of God, sorry. That's the first part. Then he goes into say, and who it is that is saying to you. The next is that you would have asked him. And the final portion is he would have given you living water. And then I'm going to box living water as well. So let me throw some color in here quickly before my eyes go wonky. Want that color? Verse 10, if you knew the gift of God. So basically this, he's making her curious about the things of God. That's the first thing that he's doing with this conversation. He's really making her curious about those things of God. Verse 9, Jews would never touch utensils. Yeah, Tanya, they really did a lot. Like, I feel like they were really just um, uppity towards them, which was so wrong and obviously so not like Christ. And a lot of us still act like that sometimes. But yeah, but I, I, I like how this story ends with the Samaritans because of how nice 
and um kind jesus is not just to this female samaritan but to all of them like jesus is awesome but um yeah if you knew the gift of god so basically he's making her curious about the things of god and if you read romans 5 and 15 it says but the free gift is not like trespass for if many died through one man's trespasses or through one's man through one's through one man's trespass much more have the grace of God and the free gift by the grace of the one man, Jesus Christ, abounded for many. So, I think that's interesting, um, nonetheless. So, verse 10, I'm going to say, makes her curious. My table is a mess right now. My room is not clean. I need to clean it, but I wanted to make sure that I got myself together for this video. So, bear with me people <laughs> he makes her curious um about the things of god and a cross reference for that is romans 5 and 15. All right, so then the next part for verse 10 says, who it is that is saying to you? So now he's making her more curious about who he, he is. So he started off with getting her interested in the things of God. And then he goes in to make her curious about who he is himself because she has this random man speaking to her. All she knows is that he's a friendly person. He's really kind, even though most people shun her. And even though men don't speak to women, and Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. So now she's going to get curious about who he is. So um, gets her to, I'm sorry, makes her curious. About who he is. That thing is getting on my nerve. I'm not sure if you guys can hear that, but... <laughs> Whatever they are doing out there is irritating me, literally. Like, oh my God. Every time I try to make videos, something always has to happen. <laughs> it never fails, but that's okay. We're going to push through. The third portion of this is, it says, you would have asked him. So now he gets her to think about how she could know them better to be able to ask of or for something because you, you really can't just ask somebody something you have to be able to, like, you have to know that person in some form of fashion. Now there are some people out there in the world who can ask you for something and they don't even have to know you. Um, but most people, before you ask them for anything, you really want to know who they are. So now he's putting into her mind that maybe she should know who he is she should know who god is that way she should you know that way she could be able to ask um something of them mm. so gets her to think about How she could <laughs> know them better to ask Okay. The last portion it says, and he would have given you living water. Now this makes her curious about what he could give her.
the last portion living water um living water is basically spiritual water that would quench your spiritual thirst and give life to you so And we already defined what um your thirst what thirst is, which is where is it? To be thirsty is basically to desire earnestly, painfully feel want of and eagerly long for. So that is that to give life. Cross references for that are Jeremiah. 2 13 and then 17 13 good point maria good point yes definitely um half breeds and just mixed cultures and everything uh where'd it go jeremiah 2 and 13 i'm gonna read that to you guys it says, for my people have committed two evils. They have forsaken me, the fountain of living waters, and hewed out cisterns for themselves, broken cisterns that can hold no water. And then I'm going to skip to 17 and 13 of Jeremiah, which says, O Lord, the hope of Israel, all who forsake you shall be put to shame. Those who turn away from you shall be written in the earth, for they have forsaken the Lord, the fountain of living waters water so we understand that thirsty is basically a longing for it's um a earnest desire eagerly longing for something and living water is spiritual water in a sense that quenches your spiritual thirst and gives you life so this living water really quenches your longing for something it fills in that void that you have because the only thing that can fill that void is god like that that's it the only person the only thing in this world is God so that is that and okay ow moving forward to verse 11 the woman said to him sir you have nothing to draw water with and the well is deep where do you get that living water so I'm gonna underlying that whole question so Basically, Jesus had no way to obtain water, so this made the woman even more curious about how he would get or give her this water that he spoke of. So, curiosity. All right? Mm, yeah. I'm gonna go run and get me some grapes quickly <laughs> but basically all that I wrote is that her curiosity is piqued because he had no way to get this water that he spoke of but we can tell that she has a strong desire to know because now she's asking questions about it so Give me one second, ladies, and I'm going to go run to the kitchen and grab me a bowl of grapes because I'm starving. <laughs> Praise the Lord, everybody. Come on, put your hands together, get 
Um, I'm back. I'm not sure if you guys heard my brother just now being a silly person, but yeah, I'm back. <laughs> um, I just had to go grab some breaks because my belly was doing a little bit too much growling. And my crackers are not doing it. Well, I, I don't want to chew the crackers because I don't want you guys to hear me chewing it since I have the mic so close <laughs> to my mouth. And um, the cheese is just not cutting it anymore. So I'm going to snack on some grapes. Okay. What time is it? Okay. I have about 30 more minutes left and then I guess this will be a two-part session as usual <laughs> but okay so we just did verse 11 so moving on to verse 12 let me just flip my notes to the next page okay whoa okay so verse 12 it says are you greater than our father Jacob I'm going to underline that, and that's the only thing I'm underlining in this. And I'm going to use this green color because it's pretty. Okay. So I'm debating if I want to put my notes on this side or just put a sticky note. I might just do a sticky note. Yeah, I'm just going to do a sticky note. So, I'm going to write on this post-it note here with a pen. If you guys saw my desk in my room right now, like, I have three desks next to me and my bed is right next to me. And I have to stack all of my pencils on the table here because I'm running out of space. But, yeah. Okay, so this is verse 12. So, verse 12. Um, whoa. Are you greater than our father Jacob? Basically, this woman asks an honest question, seeing as he claimed that there was better water than that of the water in the well of Jacob. Samaritans claimed a lineage to Jacob through Eph Ephraim and Manasseh. And you can read about this in Genesis 48 and 120. So what I'm going to write is Samaritans. Claimed. Lineage to Jacob. Okay, going forward into verse 13, Jesus said to her, everyone who drinks of this water will never be thirsty. I'm sorry, will, will be, I'm sorry, everyone who drinks of this water will be thirsty again. So I'm underlining that and I'm going to continue reading because verses 14, 13 and 14 go together. So in 14, it says, but whoever drinks of this water, I will give him will never be thirsty again. So whoever drinks of this water will never be thirsty again. Um, the water that I will give him will become in him a spring of water welling up to eternal life. And I'm just going to continue on to verse 15. It then goes into the woman said to him, sir, give me this water so that I will not be thirsty or have to come here to draw water. Okay. And color, we, we need color. I think my favorite part besides note taking is like adding all of the gorgeous color. I really believe that's like my favorite part is because the color.
Okay. And then once I'm done with that, I'm going to knock out one more paragraph and that'll be it for today's session. And then next week we'll knock out the last half of chapter four. Ooh. Okay. So this is verse 13. Which is pink. Verse 13 is pink. I just want to put all of my highlighters and stuff back in here because I literally just have everything all over the place right now. I hate having a mess with everything all over the place. Oopsie. Sorry, guys. Sorry. <laughs> Okay, back, everything is back where it goes, alrighty. So verse 13, um, everyone who drinks of this water will be thirsty again. The people of Samaria came to the well every day to satisfy their natural thirst. Jesus used this as a way to symbolize a spiritual need and a longing that everyone has. So he's helping these, um, the Samaritan woman understand that, you know, just as everyone is thirsty for water to quench their, um, their thirst in their bodies, we all have a spiritual thirst, um, which is why we need spiritual or living water to quench that spiritual thirst. Um, so this is kind of like him trying to open up her eyes to the spiritual realm but because she doesn't really know much about it she's still kind of like i don't want to say dumbified <laughs> but she doesn't kind of see it yet so um jesus used natural thirst to symbolize spiritual need um okay the next part says whoever drinks of the water that i will give him will never be thirsty again this is in verse 14 so basically jesus is offering something that is more than a temporal satisfaction but one that I'm sorry, hold on, I'm trying to read this note. <laughs> but one that was longing, but it required a person to drink. I totally, that grammar has me so confused. Basically, without reading this note, um, Jesus offered something that wasn't temporal. It was one that was lasting and longing, and it just simply required that person to drink up the living water. And to learn more about that, you can go to Isaiah 49 and 10, and I'm going to read that quickly to you guys. So 49 and 10 reads, they shall not hunger or thirst, neither scorching wind nor sun shall strike them. For he ha he who has pity on him will lead them and by the springs of water will guide him. So Jesus is offering something that's not going to be a temporary fix. And what I mean by that is if you think about it, a lot of people use temporary um satisfaction to kind of quench their thirst and again this is not like a thirst where your throat is thirsty we understand from the definition i'm actually going to show you guys in a printable here um thirsty the greek word the past i don't even know how to pronounce that but it basically means desire earnestly painfully feel want of or eagerly long for so that is the definition for thirsty in the greek translation so whatever it is that you're desiring or whatever you have a painful want of or you eagerly long for a lot of like some people i'm gonna use people without fathers um just because my father is like he's in my life but him and my mom divorced and i don't want to get i'll get into that in my testimony video soon but basically he's around but he's not around and um when i was in college because things went left with my parents when i gra actually was graduate before i graduated high school so during my freshman year of college i 
almost flunked out honestly because I had this um this this strong desire to have my father there but he wasn't so instead of me going to god and to jesus to quench it a hundred percent what i was doing was partying i was drinking i was smoking weed like i was hanging out with different dudes and not like that but like hanging out with different friends whether it be female or um or male and i'm not talking about in a sexual manner i mean just hanging out not doing my classwork not doing homework missing classes like I was using that as my temporary fix for what I truly longed for instead of going to Jesus, which could have been a permanent satisfaction for me in that case. And it wasn't until I transferred my college that I understood it. But um, it's, th it's things like that. A lot of us go to temporary fixes for temporary satisfaction, and it does nothing but either make it worse or make you long for it even more. Um, the only thing that can be offered to you, the only thing that is available to you to give you that longing satisfaction is the water that Jesus gives, which is the living water, which is spiritual water that quenches your spiritual thirst. Hopefully that just made sense. <laughs> but yeah, so verse 14, um, Jesus is offering A longing satisfaction. Just have to be willing. And again, Isaiah 49 and 10. So even though he's offering this to her, this lady has to be willing to take that offering. Um, you can offer whatever it is you want. Like you can offer money to someone and if that person doesn't take it, it's no good to them. You can offer an education to someone, but if they don't take that education, it does nothing for them. So even though he's offering this woman this 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 living water, this spiritual water that will quench all of her needs, every desire that she has, everything that she's longing for, she has to take it upon herself to say, OK, I want this and I'm going to claim it. And um It's up to her, basically. So moving on to the rest of verse 14, it says, The water that I will give him will become in him a spring of water welling up to eternal life. So we already looked up these three words, spring, which basically in the Greek means a well, a fountain. It's basically a source of supply for water, blood, or enjoyment. Um, welling is to bubble up or gush up or to leap up. And eternal is unending, perpetual, forever, and lasting. Um, so the water, which is the living water, which is a spiritual water that quenches your spiritual thirst or your spiritual needs, right? So this living water that Jesus is offering to us that we have to accept in order for it to be of use that he gives to us will become a source of enjoyment or a source of a supply source, if you will, of the water that bubbles up into everlasting life. Okay, and that's just me breaking it down with the definitions. So the note that I put is that um, the effect of this water, which is this living water, does much more than simply satisfy the thirst of the one who drinks it. It also creates something good, something life-given in the heart of the one who drinks it. It becomes the very source of life for you. It becomes your core. It becomes your center. It becomes the very thing that sustains you and keeps you flowing and going um, so that you're never thirsty. And obviously, there will be times when a person is thirsty. I mean... It's just, it is what it is. There are times you're going to long for something. But then when you have this living water, you're able to discern if this longing is something that's good for you or if it's something bad for you. Is it something good for your spirit or is it something that you want to satisfy your flesh with? And um, I, I, that I just thought of just now. So that's a spiritual download from the Lord. Amen. But um, yeah, let me move this out of the way before I knock it over. But um, the effect, oh no, we're done. <laughs> I thought I had more time, but I guess that's it after we break down verse 15. <laughs> but um, the effect 
of this water does more than simply satisfy thirst. It creates something good something life-giving in the heart becomes a source of life and then the last verse for today is verse 15 Whoa. Verse 15, and it's basically where she says, Sir, give me this water so that I will not be thirsty or have to come here to draw water. So this woman sees this as a logical way of not doing her work. Um, and she's not looking at it in a spiritual aspect of what Jesus is trying to say to her. Though he uses the water and the well and being thirsty as um a way to symbolize spiritual need she's not looking at it on a spiritual level she's bypassing the spiritual and looking at the logical sense that's kind of like above the surface and i think a lot of us do that when we hear something we don't think of it in a spiritual manner we think of it um on the surface level and in ephesians it tells us that we wrestle not against flesh and blood but we wrestle against the principalities the powers and all of that so we need to understand that when we hear something, it's not always meant for us to just look at it on a surface level. We have to look a little bit deeper and go look into the spiritual realm to get a better understanding and be able to um, fully grasp what is being said. And I find that when you are able to grasp something on a spiritual aspect or spiritual level, spiritual realm, however you want to say it, um, it's easier to understand. I feel like if this lady immediately knew on a spiritual level, what Jesus was saying, it would have defeated the next portion, which is where Jesus gets into a conversation about her sinful life and how he still loves her. So, um, pretty much that's it. So, um, woman sees logical ways and not spiritual aspect of what he was saying so that is it I guess for today <laughs> do you guys have any questions I don't even know who is still logged on but um, if you do end up watching this later and have any questions, just comment in the group. If you're watching this on YouTube, you can always email me. I do love getting emails from you guys. I know a lot of you guys have been sending me emails and I've been appreciating them and loving them. I'm actually going to start printing out a lot of you guys' emails because they're so uplifting to me, the things that you guys write. And most of the time you guys are saying thank you to me, but your thank yous are are letting me know that I'm not crazy in a sense because even over the past two and a half three months or whatever when I stopped making videos and stopped studying I felt like I wasn't clearly hearing God but um and getting you guys' messages and your comments and your questions it lets me know I'm on track and I'm not crazy and, and I am doing the will of God um the call that he has in my life but um that is it it's 11:27. So the next session will be next Thursday. Um, I'm probably going to alternate between Tuesdays and Thursdays. I'm going to let you know. I'll probably jump into Tuesdays in another week or so. I'm just doing Thursdays right now so that way I can get back into the groove of um, making these live sessions. Um, all of these sessions will be up on YouTube by Tuesday the latest. So if I, were, if I do these live sessions on Thursday... I will have time to download them and edit them throughout the weekend, over the weekend, so that I can upload them. I want to do it by Monday, but I'm saying Tuesday just because Mondays are like my lazy days, honestly. 
Mondays are like literally my lazy days where I just sit in my bed and I read or I study or I, um, you know, watch YouTube. It's like my day to just be lazy after a blessed Sunday. That's my day. But, um, yeah, that's pretty much it for this. So the next session we will do 16 to 54. Hopefully we can fly through that. Yeah, we should be able to just fly through that. Um, that way this is not like a three part session. So this is part one to this and um i'm going to change the title that i posted this as because i did put it as the full soul winner in second miracle but i'm just going to title it the soul winner part one part two we will finish up with that again the printables are available for you to download um here in the group and if you're on youtube click the link down below to go to the google drive i have a google drive account for daughter of increase the link will take you directly to the bible study folders which will have the notes for ruth esther and now john um for that and i think that's pretty much it i hope you ladies are enjoying cling we are in our last few days of cling and then we'll be done with book club um as far as book club goes i don't think i'm going to do another book club until january or february just because i really want to get through john and john is long i mean let me just show you guys john chapter six chapter five has how many verses chapter five has 45 47 verses chapter six so here it is so john chapter five has 47 verses chapter six has a total of not i think 72 verses yes 71 you know 71 and then they're m mainly like in the 40 50 verse range i think chapter no let's see i'm just flipping through to see i think chapter six was by far the longest one if i'm not mistaken at 71 the rest are like i said in the 40 50 range so most of the time they will have to be two-part videos and there are 21 chapters Again, I'm not sure what I was thinking when I said let's study John because I forgot how long John is. I'm just flipping through to see the longest. Yeah, the, I think the longest chapter is chapter 6 with 71 verses. Because the rest are in the 40, 50 range. And then as we get towards the end of John, it's more so in the 20, 30. So, um, yeah. I'm trying to fly through this before Christmas because I don't want to spend, you know, next year doing this. But if we have to go into next year, I just want to be done with it by January 2019, the latest. But my goal is before December. So we'll see how that works. Um, we'll see. I'm going to figure some things out because I don't want it to be too long. But um, book club, I'm going to start posting up polls for the next book clubs. I'm going to start posting up polls for probably the next bible study i think i want to do one of the minor prophets because it's i, I don't want to do something so long after the john like john is so long <laughs> but um yeah that's pretty much it so if you can download the notes you can keep your phone you can have it saved on your computer you can print it out like i did um and that's pretty much it for today you guys i hope you guys enjoyed this session i am glad that i am back to doing these sessions um and I guess that's pretty much it. So I'll see you guys in the next video. I hope you guys have a blessed day. And I'll talk to you guys later. Bye.